the CMSS Med annual virtual meeting on the digital transformation of healthcare research and uh, education. Uh, for this, uh, for this, and all of our sessions, continue to the conversation on Twitter using hashtag uh, Digital Med 2020. Uh, you should feel free to use the chat and the Q and A uh, box at the bottom there to uh, share any comments, questions, and stay engaged through the conversation. Uh, this will be a very interactive session. This is no, you will see no slides. You'll just see lots of our talking heads uh, as we really explore these issues in greater depth. So I am thrilled to have um, this chance to talk to some people who really think big on this topic. I, one of my uh, board members accused me of basically just inviting all the friends of Helen to this meeting, but I have such great friends, it's so easy to do. Uh, so for this session, we really wanted to think about, um, and actually credit to Andrew for kind of coming up with this crystallization of the question. Um, what's different about this burning platform of COVID-19 that is allowing us to see an acceleration in digital transformation across all those areas, public health research and education in ways we never could have imagined before. So we'd love to have your thoughts on that from where you sit. And obviously, Russell, you bring this innovative perspective from a big health system. Um, I loved your piece on thinking about what's the, what's the next normal going to look like for systems. Andrew, your designer's perspective as an you know, unusual architect and surgeon duo um, who really thinks about design and what does it take to think about how to build surge capacity to meet COVID. Um, and Terry, who I've probably known longer than all of you, um, her days back at the uh, when she uh, ran the Indian Health Service when I was at AHRQ um, and now has this extraordinary position. Uh, please thank her for all of us as the Commissioner of Health for Pima County, Arizona and is right in the middle of COVID. Um, and just the public health and informatics perspective on what's happened by bringing public health to the table. So I'm just gonna open there. Um, anybody can start just sort of your initial impressions for like five minutes each, and then we'll just get into a dialogue. Whoever would like to start. Yeah, I'll, I'll get cracking then. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I was thinking about our chat today and reflecting really on the last eight months or so. And, I got to tell you, the last eight months have really been a blur for me, and I'm sure for, for all of us collectively. The question in my mind as I was thinking about our conversation today is, um, how do we not become numb to everything that's going on around us, right? It's, it's almost impossible, but how do we actually not become numb to everything? Complacency is the bane of our existence, uh, especially so in healthcare. And, and healthcare, again, has been thrust um, to the front and center amidst this pandemic. And perhaps the, um, you know, the word of the day is unrelenting, right? Um, today, um, we, we head into the, uh, almost head into the remaining two months of this tenuous and tortuous year. And uh, we see what um, upwards of 9 million uh, total COVID-19 cases and I think today the statistic is uh, 229,000 deaths so far in the United States, and uh, and and you know that's that's more than uh, one per second in the United States. And for the first time, we crossed over 90,000 cases in one day. Uh, again, for the first time here, so it, it's quite remarkable how unrelenting um, this this pandemic has been. And and so the question in my mind is, you know, how do we how do we counter that? You know, how do we collectively as an industry come together from different parts of uh, the healthcare industry, uh, look beyond the walls of where we are and, and how, do we, how do we be unrelenting in our pursuit to really transform, truly transform healthcare? Because I, I think COVID-19 has become so much of an eye-opener yeah. for us in, in so many different ways. And um, so, yeah, that, I, I think that's, that's the call to action here is, you know, how do we um, truly be unrelenting to this unrelenting virus that's uh, upon us. Any thoughts about what changed in terms of the way you've approached your health system and this new uh, next normal? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, we like to call it the next normal versus the new normal because the new norm um, is that it has connotations of apprehension and uncertainty and the unknown, which are all true and it is the new norm, but, but we're purposefully calling it the next normal um, because we're purposefully creating and strategically going after some specific elements of how we're, how we're redesigning our, um, our approach, how we're really um, you know, pushing forward with some of the specific 
um, you know, elements of how we need to think about care. You know, one of the things here at Atrium Health um, that I absolutely love, it tugs at my heartstring every time I, I talk about this, is our mission statement. And, and I think it's especially relevant to our discussion today. Um, you know, we're on a mission to improve health and elevate hope and advance healing for all. And it's that for all part of the mission statement that I think is especially critical. And even with the just announced strategic combination with Wake Forest Baptist Health, hooray, really excited about that. Uh, you know, we're on the cutting edge of medicine and science, but I think it's really important for us to also be on the cutting edge of inclusion which is you know part of what we continue to drive forward um, at atrium health so lots of lots of amazing things that we're continuing to do and pivot and expedite um, with a level of urgency uh, through the pandemic and beyond hmm. i love that pivot and expedite um terry what do you think from your perspective what's been you've been through every battle i've ever known uh indian health service and uh, just, you know, work for years and years and years uh, in the IT informatics space and now public health really coming back to the fore. What have you seen that feels different about this COVID-19 crisis that you think maybe is going to finally drive us to true transformation in the digital space? Um, well, I do think it's this concept of relentless, but also overwhelming. Mm. And the issue that we've been trying to deal with is how do we leverage all the information that we have out there, wrap it in a way that integrates it with public health. And so public health is not an afterthought as we know, and really drive um, this creation of a new healthcare model with a value system that under understands and respects what public health brings to the forefront. So, uh, you know, I had never worked at a local public health department before. So after about two weeks there, and I came in in the middle, right? Well, in May, so early enough. And I came from an academic setting and the academics, you know, the coin of the realm publishing grants. The coin of the realm in public health is empathy and it is inclusion and it is caring and it is compassion. And at the same time, it has to be integrated with the academics and with the science. Um, I've coined this phrase lately, precision epidemiology. You know, we talk about precision medicine. Mm. We need precision epidemiology. And, and what that means is we have um, an intimate interdependence on what the clinical care system is doing that will require, I think for all of us, a better integration, a better sharing, a better understanding, and a better decision-making process for us to be able to address, in this case, the pandemic. Without that, we are all suffering. And yeah. we, uh, just this morning, our numbers are going back up again, and I, I think we're all distraught and dismayed. And uh, I had a discussion and I said, you know, my concern is I don't know why. And I had three people said to me, I know why, I know why, I know why. I'm like, how do you know why? I, you don't have any data. You're just like, I'm glad we all, we all have great speculative data. and We had great retrospective data. But so I, I think for me right now, what, what this gives us, uh, especially at the local level, this ability to envision with the healthcare system, where do we want to go? What's the value we want to have? What do we want to do, um, uh, Rasu, from an inclusion perspective? How do we want to make sure that the optics and the integration of equity are uh, a foundational factor in our decision making? And, and I also think uh, technologically, we are going to see tremendous uh, advances. I, you know, we've talked about interoperability, Helen, for a very long time. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> and I feel like I'm sometimes having repeat conversations, but I also see right now changing happening, um, driving to more interoperability that is required because epidemiological response has a timing mm. uh, factor that isn't 17 years, isn't 12 years, it's 24 hours and we have yeah. to be able to respond to it. Those are so many points to come back to there. I, I, I can't even start listing them. This, this is fabulous. Andrew, your view as the sort of design guy who got called upon to redesign ICUs in like a blink because you happen to be a surgeon and a architect and a designer. What's different about 
COVID that you think is driving this innovation in a way that nothing else really has before? You know, well, thanks so much, Helen, for organizing this and uh, having me be involved. Um, you know, I lived through this in sort of three different views as a my first primary role as a general surgeon. And when we decided we need to cut back on procedures, a lot of us got recruited to ICUs. So working in ICUs, taking care of COVID patients, and we still didn't really know the treatment algorithms. We still didn't really know what vent settings were gonna work. Um, I've also experienced it as a formerly trained health services researcher and already starting to think about all the natural experiments that are happening and how are we gonna look back on this and make sure we learn from it. And then before I did either uh, medicine or research, I studied architecture, um, longitudinally involved with the AIA and design and health work, uh, but also work in a global design firm. So I was on phone calls in New York and Italy and in San Francisco thinking through what's everyone trying to do? How are they accommodating their capacity? And I think one thing that stands out to me was that the threshold for innovation became so low. If you would have told someone a year ago that I'm gonna drill a hole in a window, attach a ventilation system to create negative pressure in a patient's room, you probably would have got like thrown out of the meeting. And all of a sudden that was like the genius idea that we need to do across the entire floor because all of a sudden we need 300 ICU beds in a week. Um, and I think that pattern is like a moment right now where the threshold for innovating is, is primed and I hope we take advantage of it. Um, the other example that really stands out, I know Ross, you can speak to this too. A year ago, if you asked providers to do virtual visits, I think we were stuck somewhere in like the five to 10% range. Mm. All of a sudden we jumped to 90% and yeah. sustained it for months. And it was kind of like, where was the big disconnect? How did the threshold lower so much that all of a sudden everyone became activated. So I'm actually optimistic. We're in like a golden era of innovation and design where ideas a, a year ago would have sounded ridiculous. Um, we now have some proof of concepts that are actually very feasible and could work um, and that we should try to formalize them and keep them moving forward. Yeah, those are great. Um, wow, so many amazing threads there. I, I love this concept of a the innovation threshold being low, how does that change what's possible, Rasu, in a health system, right? It, it, is the threshold low enough now that you could push things that maybe, you know, really get to where you wanted to go, but a couple of years ago, somebody would have said, oh, that costs too much, or that's crazy, or, you know, what's different? Yeah, um, so the threshold element is really important. And, um, you know, as was discussed, even around virtual, you know, we're able to stand services up in such a such a nimble way and, and really scale things up in, in ways that we just not imagine it to be possible previously. I, I think there are a couple of things here to consider. One is, um, as a health system, we proved to ourselves the value of speed and quick decision making. And mind you, this is this is very uncommon in healthcare. You know, healthcare is not known for right. speed and quick decision making, right? Uh, quite the opposite. So, so I think that's that's really important going forward. Secondly, we showcase the benefit of investing in digital solutions. And and yes, you know, um, while we all talk about how we rose to the challenge, and we certainly did this. The truth is, those who went in with a bit of prep. Um, ahead of time, we're able to scale things up with a lot more agility. Mm. And that's true for us at Atrium Health, where, you know, we'd invested in over the years and established our virtual platforms of care. And it enabled for us to meet the exponential bump up, right? 7,500% increase in our virtual video visits. This is, you know, remarkable. And, and then specific programs would be the third things where we're able to essentially just launch things overnight, um, whether it's leveraging GIS capabilities to hotspot out, um, it, you know, zip codes that needed, you know, our, um, our COVID testing uh, capabilities. So we mm -hmm. sent out, you know, our vans, our mobile vans to those areas. And overnight, we're able to essentially, quote unquote, you know, have them on par with the other more well-off zip codes that had access to all of these facilities and capabilities. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, overnight, almost standing up our Atrium uh, Health Hospital at Home program and really ensure, you know, the capabilities of not just you know, keeping patients that didn't need to be in the ICUs away from the ICUs and, you know, in their homes and 
being monitored by uh, digital remote monitoring capabilities and, and a number of other uh, capabilities from a care team perspective. It, these were things, programs that were able to essentially stand up in such a short period of time. So that speed, um, the agility, as well as sort of the investments in digital solutions um, and, and bringing together these specific programs that really create impact where they're needed the most, I, I think those are specific things that we can really take forward. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'd love to return to your comment, Terry, in light of those, uh, in light of what Ross, you just said about this. Uh, I love the way you, you you framed it, the the need for sort of an intimate, intimate interdependence between public health and healthcare. You know, we, we've lived in these two silos forever. Um, they so rarely cross. You're probably one of the few people who's, you know, crossed that permeable membrane back and forth, Terry. Um, you know, what do we need to do to make sure that those connections stay permeable in the way both around data, but also expertise? I mean, you were there, you know, how many, you know, classically trained informaticists are in public health, right? How many people are in leading health systems like you, Rasu, with that same background? Any thoughts about how we foster that and make it keep going? Well, you know, I, I think COVID has given us this opportunity. Um, and I think this is probably true for Rasu as well as Andrew, that what we've been able to do as a public health department is, is, is reinforce um, t what were to a, in a sense, tenuous relationships that were built before with our businesses, with our K through 12 schools, with our universities, with our healthcare settings, because the value proposition has changed, right? There's a recognition that public health is bringing not only knowledge and experience, but also information to the table. And they may be bringing it in a quicker, more efficient way than the healthcare systems may have access to. So for instance, if we're on a call and we're we're able to not only look at what the ICU bed capacity is and what the overall bed capacity is, but be able to say, hey, you know, we have this early insight into, um, let's see what you're talking about, into testing. And we know that in this zip code and in this sense that we've been doing a lot of census track work, in this census track, we're seeing this. And this is the morbidity and mortality that seems to be affiliated with that. We are able to solidify the value proposition. And I think that that's the critical the, the glue that we bring right now, which is so important and hopefully will sustain itself beyond the COVID pandemic because we have established not only, um, we've not only glued the pathways we've had, we've brought other people to the table. So from a collaborative space, which is mm -hmm. I think what all of us would recognize the healthcare system of the future to be integrated intimately <laughs> needs to have that collaboration as a foundational part of it, that we've been able to use COVID to do that. Yeah, that's really interesting. So Andrew, that's the logical lead into you, right? We, your space of coming, you know, I don't think there are many physician architects who are the chief medical officers of design firms. You know, what is your take about what um, what Terry just said? What does it take to get to that collaborative space? And do you think it'll continue beyond COVID or, or what can we collectively do to make sure it stays beyond COVID? Yeah, I, I love these comments about broadening the table of collaborators and who comes in. Um, certainly within healthcare that's happening, but you know, before COVID, there was already a blurring of lines between the healthcare and non-healthcare sectors. But now all of a sudden it is like everyone's on board for health because their literal day-to-day -day life is affected. So within the design firm, for example, um, all of the clients now say, we're not gonna pay for you to fly to our site. So you need to be able to do this work remotely. But what that does is it actually opens up an enormous opportunity to be way more creative yeah. about who your collaborators are. So wouldn't it be great if the next time you design a hospital, you have the world's best stadium designers and the best airport designers who think about large capacity surges all the time, who think about leveraging technology to do processes of care all the time. And so I've been on a couple of those phone calls where the people who've designed LaGuardia's airport, Mercedes-Benz wow. Stadium are thinking about flexible hospital capacity. And I was like, why didn't we do this before? Like this is like right in their wheelhouse and they feel great about it because this is like the moment to think about health. And so um, I'm very optimistic that the way the business has had to change in design, that it's actually making it much easier for us to be much more creative with our collaborators about who actually gets involved in the design work. It's so interesting because surge capacity really comes out of public health. I mean, as Terry knows, when we were back in the days at IHS and HRQ, 
that was a huge part of what we were all working around the biomed uh, terrorism uh, risks and everything it was all about surge capacity. And then that, and then that crisis sort of faded away and nobody talked about it anymore. Um, and yet surge capacity is what happens every day in emergency departments. Rusty, from where you sit at a health system, this must be stuff you think about all the time and thinking about how to innovate it. it do you think some of this um, post COVID different thinking around uh, sort of thinking about who should come to the table to talk about surge might be different this time? Yeah, yes. So the answer is yes. And we're, we're thinking um, about this also from a strategy perspective, you know, really capitalizing on, you know, everything that's transpiring around us and, and not wasting um, the crisis, right? So as Winston right. Churchill said, never let a crisis go to waste. And, and, and during a major crisis, the natural tendency is to focus on mobilizing your organization to meet that thread. And we, we've absolutely done that as a health system, but also at the same time, you know, as we're talking about, you know, rising to the challenge, you know, the surge work and everything that we're talking about, the imperative is also to start planning to thrive after the crisis. And, and that's something that we've been, even through this pandemic, really, really hyper-focused in on and I think that's where, you know, looking at, you know, some of the uh, partnership opportunities, the collaboration, um, the, the transformative relationships that you can foster, even through a time like this really comes into play. Uh, sort of valuable sort of non-traditional partnerships, right, right, that really come into play and, and, and engaging in this post crisis planning, even amidst the pandemic. I, I think that's something that's really difficult for a lot of different organizations and systems, especially when you're living through a crisis like this, but there's no better time than now to actually do that. And that's essentially what we're doing, right? So just very quickly at Atrium, we launched a, a program uh, that we were calling the uh, Rapid Scan and Plan Program. And it's a process to do just that. And we, we went through a deep set of exercises and, and, and really looked at our collaborators and, and um, made a number of specific bets in terms of how do we come out of this winning? What does winning even look like? Right? And then we constructed a bimodal dynamic portfolio of strategic programs that really allows us to optimize our today while strengthening our tomorrow, really focusing on both optimizing what's known and exploring tomorrow's growth areas, especially around digital acceleration. And you know, we're calling it the rise and reshape program now. Hmm. But, but that's the difficult bit, Helen, right? It's difficult, right. but it could really differentiate between the winners and the losers. They keep pitfalls to avoid staying so focused on the today at the expense of planning for tomorrow, even amidst a, a crisis like this. It's such an important point, sort of that urgency of now, making sure we don't sort of lose sight of where we need to build and go to. Terry, how does that affect your vision of what you're trying to build? I mean, one of the things you shared with us was how many partners you've brought together, for example, around being able to do contact tracing. I mean, who would have thought partners in health would be coming to Arizona to help you do that? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that is, again, I think just a suit, an incredible opportunity to think differently. Yeah, I, do I, and I also want to follow up on what Rosie said, because I agree with you, no good crisis should go to waste. And we're actually in the midst of doing a strategic plan. And my staff is like, are you out of your mind? And I'm like, no, now is the time. Now is the time for strike while it's hot. It's really bad. Hopefully it won't get worse. And we yeah. can use this to envision where we want to go. And a lot of that is dependent upon, Helen, what you said, the voices that we bring to the table. So yeah. we've been really Lucky in Pima County, Partners in Health has chosen us to be one of their focused jurisdictions. Um, the U.S. Digital Services is here. CDC is here this week to help me do some evaluation. Resolve to Save Lives um, has gone out there. You know, I'm a great mendicant. Helen knows this from all my years of working with Indian Health Service. I'll ask anybody for anything to help us. And so we're patchwork quilting. And the beauty of this in some ways is we're creating a table that they can then connect for their work outside of Pima County, I can say, hey, you guys, this other group is doing this amazing work. You don't need us in there. Just learn about each other and be together. But, but this opportunity to do strategic planning, um, some of this is because of the county I work in, which is a very eclectic county, uh, rural, semi-rural, two Indian reservations, the largest border with Mexico, um, minority majority. But our board is committed to saying to us, 
how do you, where, where do you fit in that next vision? And we have to work on that now. The other thing I would say too, and people say this about local health department, which I had never heard, because remember I'd never worked at one. Local health departments are like speed, speed skis. You can just choose and go. Um, so unlike all my years in the federal space, which I adored and loved, but I, the other day somebody said to me, who makes that decision? I said, I make that decision. So um, in some ways it's also where your power base is and your ability and how much you can influence. And so for that entrepreneurial thing, that ability and um, Rasu and Andrew, I'm sure this is true for you, the, the decision maker, if the decision maker is local enough, man, you can speed along. Yeah, cutting through layers of bureaucracy can make a difference. And I think that's part of what happens in a crisis, right? Some of that sort of peels away in, uh, in ways we don't really expect, which is remarkable. Um, you, you all in your opening comments also made comments about equity. Um, and in particular, Andrew, you even raised the issue um, in our prep around this question of, you know, are there also opportunities to use this crisis as a way to get closer to having data to really look at equity, improve equity, as well as structural racism? Any reflections on what you think is doable now? Um, we had a great, for example, over the summer, one of our COVID-19 clinical registries webinar where Kirsten Bibbins Domingo did this extraordinary presentation about the importance of place as a social determinant. Where, where does that fit in your mindset? How are you able to look at, for example, geocoding or other sources of data that maybe wouldn't have been the kind of stuff you would have looked at before? Yeah, I think one of the patterns that was very obvious is that the burden of COVID did not fall evenly. Who got exposed to COVID? Who got access to healthcare from COVID? Who uh, mortality rates of COVID? They're all disproportionate. And I think in healthcare, you know, we love to say that um, every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. And when you see the same pattern over and over, you have to ask, why is it that way? Um, and so I asked that actually within our design firm when we had all the non-healthcare people on the firm. And mm -hmm. someone just very pointedly, one of the planners said, how can you have equitable health without equitable communities? How do you expect people to access the system the same way if their homes and their communities aren't the same? And it was pretty striking. Yeah. Um, in that moment when you just realized all of the structural disadvantages of certain neighborhoods. And then if you actually really wanna think about equitable healthcare systems and delivery, it actually means you think about equitable communities. And I think one of the unique moments we're in now is that most healthcare systems and insurers have gotten so big, they have a large geographic prominence in large areas where they can start to invest in communities. And that becomes a real um, strategic uh, decision for them to help um, communities that are structurally disadvantaged. So there's probably some interesting um, policy levers that are going to be involved there in terms of once you're above a certain size and a certain percent of your um, resources need to address some of these target needs, um, which is exciting for me. I think the other thing I'm really excited about in this group is all of us care a lot about rigorous data and data analysis. We're all formally trained and very committed to it. Um, and I think one of the things that's been striking about expanding the collaborators is <clears throat> for people who aren't formally trained in health services or health policy, have you made it accessible to them to get knowledge and access to those tools? Um, so at Michigan, we started a formal health services research uh, fellowship. That's a formal master's in health policy, healthcare analytics, econometrics, uh, specifically for architects and urban planners. So bringing a whole different cohort of people into the work that so much in, of us in healthcare are accustomed to, uh, deliberately trying to structurally make the collaborations lasting and more permanent. That's remarkable. Rasu, from where you sit, especially now that you've gotten an even bigger uh, table to set with the, with the merger, how has your engagement with the community changed in terms of your ability to maybe um, really help push on the equity front? Yeah, uh, equity is such an important part of our strategy here, Helen. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier our mission statement and the for all part of that mission statement. You know, it's not just improving health, but also elevating hope and advancing healing, but for all. And that's so important. And so what, is, what does it really mean to be on the cutting edge of inclusion is a big mm -hmm. question that we ask of ourselves. And we, unlike almost any other health system across the country, have already been doing so much um, uh, in, in terms of serving our communities. But, but one of the things that we did even in the last several months was really double down 
on our social impact strategies and really crystallized a number of core elements. Um, there was a specific uh, um, a committee of the board even that we set up around um, uh, creating our strategy blueprint in terms of social impact with a goal, Helen, uh, by 2030, where mm -hmm. Atrium Health will reduce the life expectancy gap uh, by 50% in our most vulnerable communities. Right, so there's so much that we're doing to specifically meet that goal. And I talked earlier about some of the examples of, um, you know, GIS capabilities and, and leveraging data and analytics and, and, and predictive analytics to really hotspot out specific areas and, and go after these specific pain points um, with, with a level of vengeance. But it's also about um, doing things in a very much in a non-healthcare-esque way, right? So we're not just treating the ill and, and focusing on, on sort of the sick care elements, but really um, hyper-segmenting our populations, looking specifically at, you know, specific caveats of the social determinants of healthcare that really influence the impact that we're having across the communities. And when we did that exercise, we really distilled it down to three areas around health equity that we're now hyper-focused in on. One's really around employment. And I think that's really important as we look at poverty and unemployment and um, uninsured individuals. Yeah. But then the other is also around um, food security. And, and that's really, really important. We're seeing so much need around that uh, in behavior change and, and you know, managing hunger and healthy foods. And, and then last but not least is affordable housing. And that's such a critical uh, element um, you know, of, of, of really pushing for health equity. And as a health system to not just dabble in affordable housing, but really head on address some of the specific needs around safety, the built environment, the social capital uh, element of all of this. Uh, and it, it's just, I, I think, um, quite life-changing to be quite honest. And so we're, we're really trying to pave a direct path to address these physical and social health elements and, and make sure that we're able to not just um, you know, pay homage to the social equity uh, challenges uh, at hand, but really um, make sure that this becomes a key differentiator in the way that we're, we're approaching this. You know, this, like I said earlier, becomes the, you know, we're at the cutting edge of inclusion. That's great. I mean, so Terry, he's he's kind of singing your song, right? I mean, employment, food security, housing, that's core, like bread and butter public health. How do you make those connections? Is, is, is COVID helping you, for example, to have conversations with the health systems in Arizona that you don't think could have happened before? Yeah. Uh, so first off, um, we'll just connect with you, Rasu. It sounds <laughs> awesome. Uh, and Andrew, um, <laughs> thanks for bringing us all together, Helen. But no, I, I want to I want to go to COVID and then I want to go macro. So what COVID allowed us to do uh, was identify what the needs are for cases and contacts. So our case investigation and contact tracing includes an evaluation of what other needs are. Do you need WIC? Do you need diapers? Do you need mm -hmm. food? Do you need housing? Do you need help getting unemployment? And we've put together a whole team, Partners in Health, I want to sing their praises here. They've been very helpful uh, in leveraging other collaborative work that they've been doing. So as part of the learning collaborative. So we're really leveraging previous work we had done um, with our RISE program, which is a racial equity program and pushing that into now into COVID and letting our partners, schools, businesses, um, healthcare systems, ambulatory care providers understand the role that that has. Some of the vernacular has changed for us. So we, um, the concept of social determinants of health, we all, we all say that, and Helen, you've been saying that for 25 years too, um, but now we're talking about social determinants of work, social determinants of school, social determinants for our businesses to try to get with the belief that if we change the vernacular, if we get everybody talking about that in and of itself, that can be transformative. And the other thing is to, for us at least, um, you know, we're lucky in a public health setting because you're right, we, we can be a hub, we can be a convener. We don't have to do all this, but we can convene. We can bring justice to the table. We can bring prisons to the table. We can bring the legal system to the table. And we can say, we're bringing you all together because the transformation, the achieval of health, health justice will only happen if you're all 
at the table. Um, and, you know, um, not to say we're doing it surreptitiously with COVID because there's nothing surreptitious about COVID, but it does give you a cloak. It gives you a cover to say, we all want the same thing and we just all need to figure out how to work together. Wow. I love that social determinants of school and employment. It's just such a different mindset because health is everything. So that makes just perfect, perfect sense. Um, any thoughts, Andrew, about, you know, sustaining this, getting everybody to the table vision? Yeah, I think, I think what's um, incredibly exciting that we're in this moment where there's a lot of energy and momentum. And I think some of the work is going to be a lot of hard work and going to hit a lot of roadblocks, but there's also a lot of low hanging fruit and a lot of opportunities between these collaborations. So for example, we, um, I had this like pipe dream of an idea that I called health and all design that kind of played on health and all policies. And it's interesting that when I went to the people who design college campuses and said, what if you retook a college campus and did it with health as a priority? If you tell them that before they start the plans, they're like, oh yeah, there's four or five things we could easily do. It wouldn't really change the budget and it wouldn't really change the timeline of the project. We just normally wouldn't have it on our priority list, but if it was, we could integrate those. And across almost every sector, there's examples where that could happen. There's certainly things that are challenging and have a lot of trade-offs, but there's no question that if we broaden this idea of health having a broader impact and that we could change health outcomes through multiple levers, if you give designers that platform and design challenge up front, you can totally do it. So I would put the pressure or the challenge on clients to say that if you're an office, if you're designing a hotel, an office building, a large civic structure, put in your RFP, demonstrate how this project is going to make health a priority for the people who engage that space. And every designer will figure out how to do it. They'd love to do it. It just needs to be asked up front. So I'm hopeful this becomes a bit of a podium moment where everybody starts to do that. Um, and I think we'll be, get much more leverage in advancing the broader agenda of health, um, broader than just healthcare. That's great. As I think about from where we sit, 45 specialty societies coming together to think about how we can improve education and healthcare and um, learning and research. There's, you know, even your specialty societies, right? I mean, WFP, ACR, um, ACS, huge opportunities here. How do you see these very large, often very well-funded groups who have such reach into our clinical communities as agents to try to keep pushing some of this new mindset forward. Yeah, um, so let me, let me take a stab at that. You know, it's, it's interesting, even as we're living through this pandemic, we have to deal with a you know, variety of epidemics, right? So pandemic and then epidemics, this epidemic of loneliness. Uh, you know, we talked about social determinants and the things yeah. that we need to be doing from a social impact perspective, the epidemic of clinician burnout, for goodness sake. I mean, there's this so much do more with less uh, in terms of the realities of, of uh, where we are today in our, in our primarily um, you know, fee-for-service environment. And, 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 and then the many grave challenges and chronic illnesses that have really been only exacerbated as a result of the pandemic. So even amidst the pandemic, you're, you know, you've got the variety of epidemics that we're living through. And your question about um, you know, the specialty societies and, and how do you support digital transformation? Perhaps, um, perhaps that's a new role uh, that we need to really um, think about, right? A new role to support digital transformation post pandemic. I'd, I'd argue that these specialty societies need to perhaps approach some things in exactly the counter approach to how they've been doing this. And, and I say this as a radiologist who belonged to you know, RSNA and the ACR and SIM, the Society of Imaging Informatics and Medicine, and I also interact with other uh, societies, HIMSS and, and many, many others. But I think it's important for us to broaden our aperture, to focus um, uh, you know, well beyond the walls of our specialty and purposefully focus on the often uncomfortable areas of the points of intersection with yeah. other specialties, other interests, and even other industries, which I think is what we're talking about here. Because without doing that, then we're just going to be stuck in the rut of, uh, of exactly where we've been in the last couple of decades. And we yeah. won't be ready for the next pandemic that will hit us. We won't be ready for the next catastrophe that's going to hit us. And we're not going to transform ourselves from where we've been stuck in over the last many decades. 
I love the broaden your aperture sort of to me it's a, it, it's a great tagline for CMSS we broaden your aperture uh, Terry uh, what do you think you, well, you know, I, from the informatics perspective, I think there's huge opportunity, right? Digital transformation right. can obviously have at a core the, the informatics clinical, American Medical Informatics Association. But, but I think it's a challenge to us because the challenge is not um, in this context, especially that we've been talking about, is not to create technology for technology's sake or technology because it's the next bright, shiny thing. It, and not to diminish the need for those things, but to actually say that we have a priority to create tech, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> technology that is critical and has use and can be integrated right away. Yeah, and Amia is one of our members, as a matter of fact. So you know, thinking about how we bring that expertise across the other societies is a huge opportunity that I don't think we've really taken advantage of. Andrew? Uh, and yeah, I think one of the things we think about these big specialty societies um, is this isn't really an option. Like they have to do it. So taking the lesson from COVID, when operating rooms got shut down, there were a lot of surgeons who's we're not getting, um, we're not generating revenue for months. And so yeah. it's in the specialty society's interest to make our systems as robust as possible to be able to handle it. So I don't, I think with that realization, I think the special societies don't need too much of a nudge, I hope, and they'll realize this is important and we'll just get to doing the work instead of arguing um, if it's necessary or not. And the ACS was really out in front and was very proactive about guidelines. I think one of the things specifically for surgery that I think we're going to learn um, as we um, take advantage of a lot of the data that's been generated in the last few months is that a lot of the things we thought we needed to provide care may have been a little overkill and that there's a lot of services we can provide in lower overhead facilities with less resources that we can do safely. Um, and I think once we start to figure out and recalibrate that, um, it'll make all of our societies better. Um, and I think the societies have a real self-interest in figuring that out quickly. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a great point. I, lots of people have been cross-training. And in fact, those guidelines for reopening were done together with, you know, between anesthesia and surgery. They weren't just done in silos, which I think is a really important um, message uh, going forward. Um, I want to talk a little bit about telehealth. That is such a, a not so much about the research piece, but just this remarkable growth we saw in telehealth. And then everything we've seen, you know, in the last couple of months suggests it's kind of going down or maybe plateauing again. Um, what do you think is behind that? How, you know, is that an example of the sort of classic um, pathway of something, you know, like the, the, it's hyped, it's really up there, it's desperately needed, and then it's kind of back to business as usual? Is it the uncertainty around payment? Is it just that it's really hard to get clinicians to change behavior? What do you think? Prasu, this has been a big part of what you've done, certainly in your health system, and you're thinking about it. Thank you, Helen. And we've engaged in a lot of conversations online in our um, telehealth now, uh, tweet chats and such. But you know, it, it's it's really interesting when you think about um, the embrace of telehealth uh, and virtual care uh, through this pandemic. It, I, I talk about how you know this is it was an overnight success story that was thirty years in the making, you know, and and it's true because you know it, it, it's not a new thing. It was just you know we've been doing it for such a long time. Teleradiology has yeah. been omnipresent for such a long time. But one of the things we did do was we saw a need through the pandemic to really ramp things up and whether it was telephonic visits or virtual video visits, it, it really got dramatically ramped up. And to your point, Helen, it then started to tether down. I'm happy to report that in our health system, it hasn't completely gone back to where it was previously. It's, it's less than right. what it was a couple of months ago, but it really actually hasn't gone down. So we're, we're actually um, looking at different ways in which our clinicians are working right now and different ways in which you know, the technologies and the capabilities are continuing to be utilized. You know, we turned on AI powered chatbots, we ramped up on our capabilities in terms of virtual, virtual video visits. And we really um, not just nudged the specifics of the workflows, but really ramped it up in ways that will make the human behavior element of this more permanent. Because I think that's essentially what we're talking about here. And part of the reason why we've seen in other health systems, 
um, you know, it sort of the pendulum swinging back to where things were previously is the habitual elements of, of providing care. You know, we are, we are but human beings and, and we have a way to sort of go back to revert to old habits. And, uh, and, and when the pressure of that pandemic isn't there anymore and we, we then open up our health systems, even in a COVID safe environment, and we've been championing sort of COVID safe initiatives there as well. Um, you know, this habitual behavior is easier to execute than new ways of engagement. Yeah. And, and so I think it's really important to understand that it's not a black and white thing, right? Is it virtual visit versus an in-person right. visit? The reality, and this is how we've been really re-strategizing around our care transformation elements, the reality is that it, it, it actually needs to be woven into the fabric of care redesign, where virtual is not a black and white option. It's part of even in-person visits, right? Including even things like surgeries uh, where you know you have sort of the prehab component and there's sort of a virtual component even if you as you're engaging with the consumer and with the patient and, and then obviously there's an in-person element and then there's more of a virtual component at the other end uh, and, and you're bookending these um, so that you're actually not just focused in on that episode on that specific uh, transaction that you may do with that patient but you're focused in on the through and through experience from uh, from from an end to end perspective, and I, I think if we think about um, you know the role of virtual from that perspective, and really then hyper focus on the care redesign element, and yeah. embed that um, to change behavior, uh, but 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 make sure that that's also tied to the business model of how you operate your services, then I think there is a chance to really take this to a whole different level. It's really interesting. So Terry, I mean, a lot of what's been happening with. Uh you know, contact tracing is being done via text messages and things like that. Are you seeing more uptake? Are people willing to respond to those kinds of messages? Are you seeing evidence of sort of continued digital divide of some patients just not being able to respond and access messages? It's a really good point because I think public health is struggling with um, how to accelerate technological solutions and integrate them into what we're doing. So contact tracing, multiple calls, multiple text messages, please just pick up the phone. Um, the problem is that at the end of the day, we have to talk to a human somehow. We could talk to them by text, but most of the time we have more specific questions. So we really need their voice. So how do we integrate that? Um, I'm fascinated, Rusty. We, we've been looking at some AI bots specifically for cases and contact tracing, how can we deflect the, the large human burden in terms of interaction and make some of that more technologically appropriate and answered so that the, the pertinent critical questions we can get at. But Helen, I, I, I think that as we look forward to the future, we look forward to the new healthcare modeling, we have to figure out how public health is integrated into that and can leverage and exploit all this other technological work that's being done in the clinical realm because we are the second child, right? We're still the secondary use of data. I've said for years, as you have, that we're really a primary use of data, but in until we're at, at that table, we're meeting public health as an equal player um, because, because, we're, because there's value. I, I think how the integration of technology happens will be a second thought. So interesting. I mean, if you ask most docs, they probably have no idea how to report a case to the public right. health department, right? So hopefully that changes our mindset in a way we've, we've always dreamed of, right? I always ask my residents, so do you know how to report? They're like, never talk to them. Lab no interaction with them at all. But now all of a sudden you're getting all these notes from the public health department about things you should do or shouldn't do. And you know, the question is, can some of that really come together? Andrew, how about the virtual piece from where from where you sit, either surgically or just sort of broadly at the health system yeah. level? I mean, this probably is an example of if you asked me a year ago, Andrew, two thirds of the patients you're gonna operate on, you're not gonna meet until the morning of surgery. I would have told you that's crazy, but that's exactly my practice now. And I do it and it's great. And because we have such a large catchment area, a lot of patients who live three, four hours away are very grateful they didn't have to drive down here twice or three times to get their procedure. So there's definitely a real need. I think one of the important observations in the telehealth data that's been clear, although some health systems went up to 90 plus percent of appointments going um, to telehealth virtual platforms, 
in a lot of health systems that also meant a third or half of the patients just weren't seen. In other words, there was a segment of patients who didn't have access to be able to do it that way. So I've been incredibly impressed with the VA who's gone out of their way to actually enable patients with smart devices so that they have those at home and that's the way they can get to a lot of their important appointments. So I think the hand in hand with this idea of transforming and including telehealth in our delivery model comes back to the equity piece that a lot of us have been right. so passionate and cornerstoned about. Um, we need to make sure that the telehealth becomes as accessible to um, as broad of our population as possible. And that, um, you know, there's still gonna be some patients who need to be seen in person and that's fine, uh, but we certainly can do better than the 5% we were at a year ago. Yeah, I know that makes sense. One of that, we, we had a great session earlier on uh, telehealth and um, uh, Jorge Rodriguez from the Brigham had this great last line that said, you cannot tell a patient's likelihood of using telehealth by looking at them. Yeah. which I thought was really powerful. Like there are so many yeah. social determinants, understanding of your technological basis. I just thought it was really, it was very powerful. Chad was on that as well from, from Michigan, El Abudo, really kind of giving that perspective on um, the technical piece of this. But I, the, you sort of raise an interesting point about devices. So we've talked about this on some of our telemed you know, tweet chats as well. So if some patients have devices at home, like glucometers and scales, and you know now in the world of COVID, Terry, you know, do you have oximeters? You know, is some of this, and even for where you sit, Ross, is some of this actually getting those technologies out to your patients so they can engage in a different kind of way? Terry, are you guys giving out oximeters or anything or trying to get people to share those readings so they can get at, they don't have to go to the hospital and track themselves at home? Well, we're giving thermometers. So, <laughs> so <laughs> let's be real. Basic. Public health poor man approach. Yeah, yes. that's really helpful. But you know, I mean, from COVID, as you know, there's a ton of applications out there to assist now with contact tracing. Uh, if you're a case, you send a memo. The thing I would warn us all about with all of those from an equity perspective, uh, the, the equity lens on that gets really difficult to figure out what to do, right? If you don't have a smartphone, the flip yeah. phones can't be used for contact tracing. Is that okay? Um, where do you end up with that? What is the moral equity discussion that needs to be had? So I would just posit there is a discussion to be had. I, I don't know the answer, but if we don't discuss it, we will not end up in a good place. Yeah, great point. Yeah, I agree, Ellen. Uh, just to add to that, um, it, it, I think one of the things that we struggle with as an industry, um, and you know, Terry mentioned earlier, it's not technologies for the sake of technology, is that, look, we're already such a complex um, entity here in healthcare, and healthcare is just littered with challenges and complexity, um, and, and technology is oftentimes an impediment to better care, not an enabler of better care. So I think we really need to focus in on simplicity and, and and it's easier said than done and Andrew was talking about design and, and some of those elements and I, I think that's really important we need to uh, you know bring this mindset of, um, of of not just adding you know more bells and whistles more tabs more buttons more features more technology right but it, but it's about making yeah. things as simple as possible taking things away um, as much as possible so that you're able to really function um, at, at a level of simplicity that really um, elevates the level of experience for our patients and, uh, and our consumers. And, and I think that we lose sight of that. So, uh, you know, when we talk about technologies and devices, yes, it's important um, to embrace remote patient management monitoring. It's, it's important to make sure that we're streamlining virtual vi video visits and, and, and such. But, but, but also, you know, it's not just about that. It's how do we connect these devices and make it as seamless as possible uh, for, for, for the data to flow back and forth between the electronic health record system, which is where clinicians primarily reside, and, uh, and, and, and the world where our patients and our consumers live in or eat in and, and play in, right? So, so that divide between their world, so to speak, quote unquote, and our world, the world of the clinicians, is one that continues to be separated even more. And I think if we're focused in on simplicity, if we're focused in on making sure that the data is able to flow much more seamlessly back and forth um, versus just throwing more technology at, at the problem, then, uh, then we have a chance to actually start making a dent at this. And that's essentially what we've been doing at Atrium Health 
hyper-focused on partnerships that build those bridges between devices, but also partnerships that address what was being addressed here, which was being talked about here, which is the social inequities that exist out there, right? Where, you know, we have these um, deserts out there in terms of technology and, and, and how do we address those deserts? How do we make sure that we're able to work with, for example, partners such as the YMCA and, and other community partners? How do we bring in um, the right types of public private partnerships even as we're pushing for some of these technology elements to better the overall simplicity of the complex healthcare environment that we're already living in. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, in the next session. Add on to that. That's such a, Please, that's such a great, such a great point, Ross. So I'd love this idea of simplicity. Uh, my um, mentor at Michigan, Justin Dimmick, um, when I started working with him and started writing, he often would quote um, the late Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes saying, Simplicity on this side of complexity, I wouldn't give a fig, but simplicity on the other side of complexity, I'd give my whole life. And I love this idea that like, we need to streamline what we're doing in a way that makes it so simple and clear about what we're about. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the last year or so with user experience designers, and they love to just ask these great litmus test questions of, like when you walk into an Apple store, do you have any idea, do you have any questions about where you're supposed to go or what you're supposed to do? It's like almost effortless to move through it. When you go to google.com, are you like confused where you're supposed to type? Of course not. It's so beautiful and clear and straightforward. And so I wish we had those same litmus tests for our healthcare delivery system. When you walk into a hospital, is it just perfectly clear where you're supposed to go? Or is there a sign that has 14 arrows with words you don't really understand? Um, in three partition buildings that are on different floors. Um, and so I, I love that idea of simplicity and I hope that's one of the things that carries through in our whole transformation forward of not just adding more layers, but actually simplifying. Yeah, I actually hired a sign consultant when I was head of quality at the Brigham to label the pike because no one, like they, you, you couldn't walk down the hallway without somebody stopping you going, excuse me, where's radiology? <laughs> so, right, it's, there's so many opportunities there to think really simple and get this done, particularly for people who don't have those tech skills. Um, you know, a lot of people just aren't used to, you know, God knows we all spend too much time on Zoom, but you know, every single one of these things, except for you guys, I've had to say, excuse me, you're on mute, right? So even like among us who spend all day doing this, there's sort of a level of how it's just not that easy. Um, so we're almost at the end of our time, which I can't believe. I just want to do a quick um, lightning round. And I feel like in, in real life, we have to have, um, we really need uh, like drinks and do this in person at some point because you guys have so much in common and so many great ideas. If you could do sort of, if, if one thing that, was, that came out of this burning platform could stick from where you sit, what would it be? And it doesn't have to be a thing like a technology. It could also be sort of a, you know, a change in the way we interact or anything. Any takers? Yeah, I, I'd say that, um, you know, this abject realization that the walls between medicine and one end, which is where healthcare has primarily been focused in on, and public health on the other end, um, those walls have already started to come down, but let's completely bring them down because it's so important to really focus in as one and, and, and really look at the whole person and, and the context in, in which um, you know, they eat, work, live and play. And, 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 and this is, there's no better opportunity than now as we're coming out hopefully on the other side of the pandemic uh, you know, through 2021 to really say, all right, let's once and for all bring the walls between medicine and public health down. I think he's singing your tune, Terry. Yeah, you know, and I want to just push on that a little. And some of that's because I'm a pretty visual person. So for me, it would be let's make sure the table stays set for anybody who wants a seat and that we reach across it. And so, so in that way, for me to have public health as an integrated, understandable, value driven um, member at that table is important. But um, obviously, we need to make sure it's extensible. Anybody that wants a seat can have a seat and, and there's a equity, diversity and inclusion component to what we do. Um, the, the other thing I would say is I, I'm optimistic despite how hard it is right now. I'm optimistic that this disruption uh, will let us be in a better place at the end of it. 
Andrew. So I think the thing I'm most excited about and I hope stays is this low threshold for innovation. I remember when CMMI initially launched, I guess, gosh, about a decade ago, this idea that we were just going to start paying people differently was like so innovative and like tested 50, 60 different models of payment. And now we're in this moment where we, in the last six months, you know, there were actually payment incentives for alternative sites of care. We actually said, we actually want you to try to deliver a traditional service in a new yeah. site and we'll pay you to try to do that. I hope that spirit of innovation and experimentation through some really explicit policy incentives and payment incentives maintains so that, you know, it'd be a shame if five years from now, we're all just patting ourselves on the back for how much great we innovated and we just rested on our laurels for the next decade. Um, I hope that that continued urgency to keep trying to innovate stays sustained. Ah, what a great, what a great way to end this session. This session has to live on. We will definitely get this one out there because it's just, the conversation was just wonderful. The three of you are such, have such innovative minds and are so always thinking about how to move past barriers and kind of make things work. So I just want to say thank you. This has been wonderful. We have one more session to go and then I'm going to go find a very large glass of wine. So our final session of the day is uh, very much sort of a similar model, but across research, education, um, and healthcare as less healthcare focus. We've got Bob Walker and Nikhil Cook, the relatively new director of PCORI and Mike Howell from Google, sort of thinking about how these come together. So you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you all my good friends for a willingness to do this. And um, let's all stay healthy and be well. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Rasu. Bye. Bye.